Hi, I'm Dr. Boz. Welcome to my channel. I am pre-recording this, so if you are here on Sunday night where it is airing as usual, I just want to say thank you for tuning in. This is uh, my test run for the lecture that I've been preparing. It feels like for a year, but probably just for the last month, uh, where I have focused on the science behind what happens in a ketogenic diet and a cancer patient. And why, do, why is it so helpful? Um, if you're new to my channel, uh, I wrote a book about my mom uh, who had cancer for over 10 years before we started the ketogenic diet. I am an internal medicine physician and uh, she's my favorite patient. She's my favorite person to care about and even all the care in the world couldn't fix what she was struggling with. And we ventured on adding the ketogenic diet to her cancer treatment she is now four years since that story started. Uh, she is, has not been on chemotherapy for six months, and her numbers are the best they've been in 15 years. So um, the book is Any Way You Can. Um, <laughs> here is a copy of it. It actually has a new cover now, which you'll see here in the slideshow just a second. Uh, I don't have one of those near me right now. I will... Uh, tell you that this lecture is being uh, given to uh, the folks in Puerto Rico who invited me to speak. Thank you for inviting me. And they're going to get a much better lecture because I'll review it several more times between now and then. But you guys are uh, in for a treat. I really enjoy the topic and hopefully you learned something. So I love seeing your comments. Uh, as uh, I've asked in the past, please like the video and share it with anybody you think it would be helpful with. I just want to say a big shout out to the people that taught me so that I can be your teacher. Uh, Dr. Miskimmons was my biochemistry and cellular biology teacher in medical school, and he has written several papers on the metabolism of cancer cells. So I met with him this past week just to review, am I saying this right? Have I got it right? And um, just want to say thank you for taking the time to teach me so many years later. Um, and also to Dr. Thomas Seyfried, who has, uh, I've read countless articles. His textbook has been like a Bible for me to understand how do I translate this into a way that patients can understand and that it makes them really stay committed to what matters in the ketogenic diet when you're fighting cancer. So let's get started. This is a great lecture. I hope you like it. Uh, for those of you out there that are new, please like the channel and share it with people that you think would benefit from this information. And be sure you're working with your medical team locally. This is education for those physicians, but also for those patients who are saying, how does it work? Why, is this, why does it help people with cancer? So here we go. All right, fighting cancer with ketones. What's that all about? So I am going to try and reach towards this be answering this question, uh, which I get a lot. Doc, how does the ketogenic diet help with cancer? And uh, it's not if, it's how. I hope by the end of this, you see that the answer is very complicated. Uh, there are so many people diving into the research of this. Uh, the American industry of not just kind of cracking the code on the chemistry part of cancer, but also the innovation to try and find medications and, and motivate patients to try to outsmart this awful thing called cancer. Uh, unfortunately, America has some broken parts to it when it comes to the medical uh, delivery system. Uh, I see lots of patients inflamed with lots of reasons why they should be on the ketogenic diet. And sometimes it takes things like cancer for us to really slow down and say, what else besides my prescriptions could be helping these patients? And I hope these lectures like this help patients have that conversation way before they end up in front of an oncologist. Um, or like my mom, have it after 10 years of being in front of the oncologist. So here's just a little outline of how I'm organizing this information. In order to talk about cancer, we need to talk about a little normal metabolism and glucose. Uh, I love the science of this, and I hope that I can translate it into a way that keeps it entertaining and simple but true uh, in uh, this lecture. And then we're going to talk about, it says three areas of cancer that are in uh, impacted by the ketogenic diet. We're going to keep it to two, and the third one, it's going to take another lecture all on its own. Uh, just my way of saying I did try. Um, all right, so this is a picture of a normal cell. So this cell is um, 
think of it as one that's just in a petri dish, but it is a, a cell that does not have cancer. And how do we know it doesn't have cancer? It's beautiful. It has a beautiful outside texture. It's got that nice big blue uh, central part, which is the nucleus or the thinking area of that uh, cell uh, that regulates how it talks to other cells, how it divides, and how it uh, repairs from the inside out. Those little bitty uh, blue specks throughout that cell are mitochondria, and that's where we're going to focus this talk. Uh, when it comes to mitochondria, they're super small, so we're going to blow them up a little so you can see that um, this is the section that we're talking about, but also um, uh, keep focused on the same places that I'm putting uh, the energy to. So these little mitochondria tootle around inside that cytoplasm and they uh, produce energy. Uh, they are breaking down um, um, units of energy to improve the uh, outcome for the cell. So this cell isn't a nice looking cell. It's ugly looking. The cell has horns and lumps and bumps. It is not beautiful. Its texture is weird uh, because this is what a cancer cell might look like. And inside the body of people with cancer uh, is a chronic level of inflammation. In fact, we might be able to be as bold enough to say that one of the first things that happens to cells when they've been bathed in inflammation is they start making errors in their replication, which leads to cancer. So if there's one wonderful part about what a ketogenic diet might be for the future, it is a protective layer against having cancer. As a, uh, a mom who has cancer and a dad who's got kidney and heart disease, I will be ketones for life. And I think the science is, is founded on how much that might prevent those problems in my own health. So here are the, here are the mitochondria in a um, cancer cell. Now, for the purposes of this, I use the exact same mitochondria that are found in a healthy cell, but there's less of them. Uh, if you took the total volume of those mitochondria, there are not as many of them in a cancer cell. And to get real technical, if you see those little wavy lines on the inside of that mitochondria, in a cancer cell, there would be less of them. It is not as intricate. Uh, those folds are... Um, not as delicate and that they don't do the efficient job of producing energy as well as a healthy cell does. All right, so this is going to be our chart as we walk through these uh, differences. We're going to compare a cancer cell to a healthy cell uh, and then we're going to see what does a ketogenic diet have to do with that. So let's just start with the overview of what happens with sugar. So cancer cells in general love sugar. Uh, healthy cells like sugar. They don't need it, but uh, they definitely will use it when there. So let's dive into what, do, what happens in the healthy cell mitochondria. Just some labels here. Yes, that's the mitochondrion, which is a singular term for mitochondria, the plural term. Cytosol is the area outside that nucleus, but inside that cell membrane. And that's where the mitochondria uh, are housed. All right, let's start with glucose. And if you've been watching my channel at all, you know that those little square fellas with happy, sad, and tired faces are the glucose. When glucose enter into a cell, we turn it into pyruvate before it enters into the mitochondrion. Once it's in the mitochondrion, we change those carbons uh, from one spot to the next, and we pass the energy along. Uh, first, we push it from acetyl-CoA into the Krebs cycle. As the Krebs cycle spins electrons into uh, through different uh, proteins and transporters, it ends up eventually at the best and most productive area of energy production, which is the oxidative phosphorylation of those carbons through the electron transport chain. This puts out an abundant amount of energy. Almost 90% of the cell's energy comes from this little spot way at the end of the tail of that um, process of breaking down glucose. If you look at the two other places that you can to, uh, turn glucose into energy, one is uh, a little bit of energy made from lactic acid after you break down glucose, and uh, another small amount of energy made uh, through uh, succinate in, uh, to succinic acid. Again, if you look at the big punchline here that I want you to notice, there's a lot of energy made when the oxidative phosphorylation part of that mitochondria works, and tiny little parts when you don't use that part of the pathway. I know it's a little sciencey, but hang in there. This is going to be important when we start comparing it to a mitochondria of a cancer cell. 
So once again, we have our little glucose fellas coming on into that cancer cell, and uh, it starts out very similarly, where glucose to pyruvate still happens outside that mitochondria, but in this case, the glucose uh, and pyru to pyruvate turns into 20% of your energy is made by then transforming it into lactic acid. Uh, as you look at that production, uh, that arrow after pyruvate is broken to turn into acetyl-CoA, it doesn't work perfectly in the mitochondria of a cancer cell. But yet, when you spin those carbons through the Krebs cycle, even just a trickle of that glucose turns into 75% of the energy found in a cancer cell. The succinic acid in combination with the lactic acid is nearly 95% of the energy that a uh, cancer cell makes. Uh, and in uh, true fashion, when you do get those little wheels to spin with the electron sending down the electron transport uh, chain and that eventual oxidative phosphorylation, I uh, you get about 5% of the uh, energy produced in that cancer cell from the best part of where healthy cells do. So again, this is a, um, a huge comparison when we get to why this works. Uh, so again, looking at cancer cells versus healthy cells, the cancer cells do love glucose. It's their favorite fuel. Uh, the healthy cells, they'll use glucose, um, and, but uh, they aren't as dependent on it. So we covered this just a little bit in those first couple slides, but I'm going to drive it home a little bit further, showing you the difference in how energy is used uh, in the healthy cells versus the cancer cells. So here again, our little glucose, we take our glucose, turn it into pyruvate, uh, run that down with a nice big thick arrow into the acetyl-CoA, the Krebs cycle spins, the electrons spin down those transport chains, and the oxidative phosphorylation happens with a big burst of energy at the end. That's the perfect way. That's the most efficient use of carbons being turned into energy. And when you have healthy cells, they don't waste an electron. They do not let one little um, morsel of energy go to waste. Um, when you look at the two other areas where you produce the lactic acid and the succinic acid, again, tiny little amounts of energy, but done very efficiently, meaning there's no wasted electrons that happen when a healthy cell uh, uses those other pathways. Now let's step into uh, the world of that cancer cell again. And once again, we take our glucose, we're gonna break it down to pyruvate outside the mitochondrion, bam, 20% being uh, lactic acid. And in the setting of that, we uh, once again, spin a few of those carbons through the acetyl-CoA and, and the Krebs cycle and out comes succinic acid. Uh, that 75% of uh, energy combined with the lactic acid uh, is inefficient. This isn't the way you want, the, the amount of carbons that it takes from glucose to make that amount of energy is a lot of glucose that spins through those uh, mitochondria in order uh, to really generate that energy. Only a wisp of energy gets sent to the most efficient area of these cells uh, through the electron transport and that oxidative phosphorylation. The punchline I'm trying to get you to focus on is these two areas where I show you the lactic acid and the succinic acid, those uh, are, it takes a lot of glucose to get that amount of energy. And uh, the wasted amount of energy that's put into the cell, you're going to see in a minute, is very dangerous for the rest of the body. I think it's interesting when I'm looking for cancer in patients and I'm worried about that, one of the lab tests that I can order is to see, is their lactic acid elevated? It's just a hint at the early stages of cancer, but it's one of the ways that we check to see, does chemo, is the chemotherapy killing the cancer? Because the production of that lactic acid is supposed to be super tiny, but in cancer cells, it's one fifth of their energy cycle. And so it's a way to measure when that mitochondria is burning the inappropriate energy, we can measure it inside patients and it doesn't feel good. You might, have remember, you might remember from high school gym saying when you re sprint really hard, you can get a lactic acid burn in your muscles. Well, cancer, cells, cancer patients live with that every day. So just because this is a little bit, uh, a little bit heavy, I try to drive this home. This is the picture of the cancer cell big energy coming out those first two chains uh, of um, the energy cycles, whereas comparing that to the healthy cell where very tiny amounts come out in the form of lactic acid and succinic acid. Uh, what does that matter? Uh, the energy is super wasteful in the cancer cells and it's very efficient in the healthy cells. 
and as we drive home what to do about that, um, we're going to now show you that um, what happens when oxygen is added to this equation. I think it's interesting to hear that cancer cells don't like oxygen. Um, cancer cells um, ha have uh, almost an aversion to oxygen. And when you penetrate the, con the cancer cells with large amounts of oxygen, those cancer cells die. Let's just take a look at why that happens. All right, here we go again. We're gonna start with healthy, healthy cells. Uh, and we're going to do this in the presence of oxygen. Here we Once have our glucose cells coming into this healthy cell in the presence of oxygen. We take that glucose, turn it into pyruvate, and inside that beautiful mitochondria, your acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle, the electrons tra transport down that chain, and out comes beautiful energy. What I like you to notice is that as the oxygen comes into this cell, it comes out as carbon dioxide and water. And just like if you take a deep breath in right now and then you blow out, you are pulling in oxygen and you are breathing out carbon dioxide and water. So as you look at the slang term for this efficient use of energy, we call this respiration of the mitochondria. And the respiration is the most efficient use of energy. It is clean. There are no extra uh, unaccounted uh, for electrons. And that respiration of the cell is a sign of health. As oxygen comes in, carbon dioxide comes out. So if you happen to read any of the papers or you look at the metabolism of cancer cells, they'll talk about them not being able to respirate or they don't use respiration very effectively. If we sink over to a different area of that cell and look at what happens when there's no oxygen in a healthy cell. Uh, we start again with your glucose to pyruvate and without any oxygen, most of that energy is gonna come out in lactic acid. Again, only a small amount, but uh, that is where we take the glucose, this is called a substrate, and we phosphorylate it. Uh, that's a lot of technical terms and the slang for that is it's called fermentation. Fermentation is when there is no oxygen and we take those carbons and transfer them in the way that we can make energy. So that's called cell fermentation. And you'll see that language a lot when you talk about energy produced in the cells that are healthy or in cancer cells. Here again, we hop inside that mitochondrion, still don't need oxygen for this, but as you spin the first little few turns of that Krebs cycle, you're gonna see the succinic acid be produced through again, the, the phosphorylation of those substrates. And just a tiny amount of energy is needed and used, and the word we use for that is called fermentation. Uh, this is what happens when you sprint running away from that lion. Those first few moments uh, of your muscle cells need energy produced in lightning speed. And that glycolysis happens outside the mitochondria. That production of succinic acid happens inside the mitochondria, but they're both very quick. They're tiny, but fast. And these are the areas that are preserved in a cancer cell. So again, this is uh, no oxygen found in uh, the, the, those cells of healthy cells. So as we look at uh, the opposite uh, uh, environment, meaning one that's not very flexible, this no oxygen, uh, when no oxygen is found inside a cancer cell, we take that glucose, we turn it into pyruvate, out comes lactic acid through that glycolysis. But once again, that substrate of phosphorylation, otherwise known as fermentation, is 20% of the energy. What does that have to do with anything? Well, as you look at the other places these smart little cancer cells make energy, they take a few cells, sneak it into acetyl-CoA and through that Krebs cycle, and they push out the, that succinic acid to keep the cancer cell dividing and alive. Here is where you start to see the damage that's happening deep inside the cells of a cancer patient. These little electrons come out of those carbon chains when there is no oxygen. And as you watch to see how much damage that does to the rest of the body, as it protects the environment for the cancer cell, you start to see how conniving these cancer cells are for the survival of our patients. As you look at adding oxygen to these mitochondria, uh, you find that the oxygenation changes um, uh, the potential for what can happen to these uh, cancer cells. So let's start in the same spot. Glucose, pyruvate, lactic acid, 20% fermentation. 
We've all got that part down. That acetyl-CoA runs through the Krebs cycle and succinic acid, bam, 75% of that energy. Fermentation for both of those, um, even though there's oxygen. And I think that's the part that's so powerful once you understand how, how naughty these cells are really being. So again, those electrons slide down that electron transport. Only 5% of the energy is coming out of that uh, setting for the cancer cells. But once again, that oxygen coming out as carbon dioxide, I have it really muted in this picture because it's just a whisper that's happening. The healthy side of that cell is very tiny. So I do think it's powerful to say that the parts of our body that are fermentable fuels include the glucose, and the glutamine, and that's through that succinic acid pathway, those are the areas that are fermentable. And by fermentation, we're looking at situations where you do not need oxygen to do that. So as we look at that cancer cell versus the healthy cell, the oxygen doesn't do any benefits for the cancer cell. Whereas our healthy cells, they love oxygen. It creates that environment for the perfect wasteless, just nothing gets wasted when you use that oxidative phosphorylation in that high oxygen setting for cancer patients. All right, let's move on to our favorite molecule, ketones. Cancer hates ketones, whereas healthy cells prefer ketones once, they're, uh, once their environments are adapted to the ketosis state. Let's start with that, that healthy cell. And this time we don't have glucose, we have ketones showing up. For those of you that have been following my channel, you'll know that these little blue uh, uh, morsels are considered ketones whenever you see them. So as ketones start uh, their uh, entrance into the scene, uh, you're gonna see these letters BHB over any textbook that you look around. I do not want you to miss that the beta hydroxybutyrate that they talk about in this cell metabolism is the stuff that's found in these supplements. I started making these supplements to give to my patients because I need them checking their numbers and proving that their ketone in that circulation is elevated. Beta hydroxybutyrate is something you can swallow and put into your cellular environment. Essentially, you're creating ketosis through a supplement. It isn't what I want patients to do for a lifetime, but by golly, when they are in need of ketones and we must shift their chemistry uh, in the setting of something like cancer or uh, just being diabetic for a long time, these supplements really are the replacement of the fuel that you're gonna see burn through these mitochondria. Uh, I do not want you to miss that they are the same thing. That's why I'm so adamant to say, just like a prescription medication for blood pressure is something I would do in somebody who's got out of control blood pressure, if your metabolism is awful, I would use the components in a supplement to get your metabolism headed in the right direction. Our goal is to get you off of this, to get you free of seeing the doctor, and I sure as heck don't want you addicted to my office. Uh, many patients have had that because of years of prescription medications that left them dependent on the prescriptions and not really coached into a way to get free of any needed supplements or prescriptions. All right. So as you look at that BHB, you, you can see that it's converted to another ketone that can enter into the mitochondria. That ketone then goes into acetyl-CoA and those carbons spin through the tra electron transport chain. They are oxidatively phosphorylated, meaning oxygen comes in, carbon dioxide comes out, and they turn out a respiration, an energy production that is even more abundant than, than glucose. Now we left that 89% down at the bottom there, but you should know that you get about 2.1 uh, more molecules of energy per carbon when it comes to the ketosis um, burning process uh, relative to the glucose burning process. So when people say, why do they feel so much better? Why is there so much energy in people when they're in a ketogenic state? This is the molecular answer. And for those of you that are uh, totally eyes glossing over, not uh, enjoying this, I am so sorry, but I love this. When I'm trying to, to motivate a patient to say, you're gonna feel better, your brain is gonna function better, your cells are going to waste less energy, you're going to have uh, the energy of your youth. I'm not kidding, I'm talking about your mitochondria when I say that to patients. And as uh, you look at you know, the mitochondrium found in a 
uh, cancer cell, we're going to see what happens when we take these little ketones. And we take the ketones, but we want to see if that beta hydroxybutyrate can spin into acetyl CoA <clears throat> and send electron transports down the chain to see if they can make energy. And the answer of oxygen through the electron transport chain is a big fat no. Your mitochondria cannot take a ketone and burn it through that electron transport chain. That little dotted arrow from the ketones to the acetyl-CoA that is broken inside the mitochondria of um, cancer cells, it does not allow the transport of these ketones into, uh, into the deepest guts of, of that mitochondria. It does not allow that. That inner, uh, inner membrane will not transport it and you will not see it turn into energy. So as we put ketones in circulation to a cancer patient, we know that we are strengthening the fuel of their healthy, healthy cells while not allowing ketones to burn through that mitochondrial metabolism uh, in a cancer cell. They can't use it. Again, glucose fermentable, glutamine fermentable, and that is the preserved energy pr metabolism in a cancer cell. Ketones are not fermentable and therefore the mitochondria of a cancer cell cannot burn them. All right, we're working through this. We've got sugar taken care of. We've got some energy that we've compared to. We've talked about the love-hate relationship of oxygen. And, and we've walked through ketones, who hates them and who prefers them. Let's move on to something called the reactive oxygen species. This is also known as free radicals, or they're electrons that aren't supposed to be floating out willy-nilly. They're supposed to be carefully contained and accounted for. And when you look at the danger that's happened to healthy cells, they have had areas where these uh, electrons have caused havoc throughout the patient's body. It aged the patient, it took away um, their longevity by shrinking some of their telomeres in their DNA. It also makes their immune system not be able to respond well. The cells don't divide correctly, and before you know it, those reactive oxygen species are creating cancer cells. Let's take a look. So these reactive oxygen uh, species, it promotes the cancer environment and it damages our healthy cells. All right, here we go. Don't lose hope. We're taking this on. So once again, we're talking about the fermentation or the non-oxygen setting of what happens in a, a healthy cell. Let's start with glucose. We're going to take glucose, turn it into pyruvate, goes into acetyl-CoA, flips through that Krebs cycle. You'll notice that big arrow coming from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA with tiny little arrows going into the lactic acid and the succinic acid. Once again, when there's not oxygen around, our healthy cells can ferment fuel to keep us energized, but it is very tiny amounts of energy. You are leaving the big efficient process on the table, if you would. When you look at the uh, mitochondria and no oxygen in a cancer cell, uh, once again, our glucose goes to pyruvate, lactic acid comes out as fermentation. Uh, we have our acetyl-CoA broken arrow turning into a little bit of flip through the Krebs cycle and our succinic acid coming out as 75% of the energy. Without oxygen, that's what you get, and those are the standard areas of production for the energy cells of these cancer. What's, what's happening uh, that doesn't really get noticed at first is these free electrons keep spinning out of that Krebs cycle. They're not supposed to be there. They're supposed to be tightly contained. And this is where, when we talk about the energy of a cancer cell is not efficient, this is what we're, at, what we're referring to. We see these free radicals continue to spin out that uh, Krebs cycle, and there are electrons everywhere in the microenvironments of these cancer cells. The reactive oxygen species, this is my favorite name for this, uh, shortened to ROS, but uh, what that means is if you add oxygen to these little electrons, you're going to see a huge explosion, which is partly why those cancer cells do not like oxygen. What it really turns into is this milieu or this uh, inflammation around the cells 
uh, that are especially in the solid tumors of cancer. When you look at the breast cancers or bladder cancer or lung cancers, the, and as opposed to the, cell, the cancer cells that are floating through the system like the white blood cell cancers, those solid tumors, lots of inflammation, lots of little enzymes called interleukins that protect the micro environment of those cancer cells. In that process, they start to proliferate, to grow, and the cancer can grow faster and faster and faster as long as these little electrons stay contained and in that area where um, they wall off the extra oxygen, they wall off the immune system, they actually get really good at outsmarting our chemotherapies. And this is where cancer cells outsmart the scientists all the time is in, these, is in this production of all these little electrons inside uh, their cells. So what happens when we add oxygen to this situation? The acetyl-CoA spins those electrons right through that central part. It does make those free radicals and the production of those electrons grows more and more. Even when oxygen is happening, that fermentation of lactic acid and succinic acid is the primary fuel source. But as it spins through the Krebs cycle, a, uh, those electrons grow more and more dense. So what happens when you add those oxygen molecules to this little mitochondria, especially in the setting of all of those electrons? You get destruction of the cancer cell. Uh, as, as you watch, the first, parts that, the first areas that fall apart are those mitochondria, but eventually the cancer cell itself cannot hold together in the setting of those electrons and the oxygen. The particles left over after the oxygen and the free radicals are uh, eliminated are the healthy cells. These reactive oxygen species have been studied greatly in the, in the world of cancer. We know that the higher numbers of those we have in life, the higher the risk of uh, a tumor. We know that these reacti reactive oxygen species promote the tumor progression, not just to divide and to metastasize throughout the human body, but also to improve the uh, blood vessels. They make these little cancer cells very resistant to chemotherapy and other radiation treatments. The inflammation is very good for cancer cells and very deadly for our patients. Finally, it weakens the immune system of our patients, which is usually what, in the end, kills most of my cancer patients. Uh, the cancer cells steal their energy. They de devour um, them from the insides out. But in the end, the inability for their immune system to fight off these, these foreign little cells living inside the human is why they die. So adding oxygen to our body turns out to be very good for our patient uh, and very deadly for our cancer cells. All right, here we're back to our chart. We've got the sugar where cancer cells love it, healthy cells like it. We've got energy, which is wasteful in the cancer cells, but very efficient in our healthy cells. We've got oxygen that cancer cells don't like and healthy cells love. Ketones, cancer cells don't have the ability to use them and healthy cells prefer them as soon as you're keto adapted. And finally, those reactive oxygen species or free radicals, those promote the cancer environment where they damage the healthy cells. So you look at what happens in a ketogenic diet, where we lower the glucose, we know that you become more efficient in the way you burn ketones, uh, and you've got um, a decrease in the reactive oxygen species. This gives a strikeout in the energy column for the cancer cells. This gives a strikeout in the oxygen for the cancer cells. Ketones, obviously, when you're on a ketogenic diet, you get in a strikeout again for the cancer cells. And those reactive oxygen environments are against the cancer cells as long as we can combine it with oxygen. So, now that you've heard about this incredible advanced lesson on the metabolism inside human cells that are cancer-free and those with cancer, you might be asking, so what? So what do I do with patients when they come to me in my clinic? Number one, you have to be educated. This is not the situation where I wanna lose a few pounds, I think I'm gonna dabble in the ketogenic diet. No, they need to understand what they're doing. Find a good book. This is the one that I wrote when I was helping my mom, 71 years old in that picture right there. She had cancer for over 10 years. And these are the little lessons that I taught her 
as she was trying to survive, trying to wake up the good metabolism in those healthy cells and destroy the metabolism in her cancer cells. And as I taught her those lessons, I turned it into a book and it has helped so many patients. If you know someone with cancer, give them this book. Not only is it a story that will inspire them to try, it has a great little basic lessons on what you need to worry about with the ketogenic diet and what is fake news. You also must check your numbers. This is not one of those cases where you can just dance through the ketosis and hope that it helps your, your cancer cells. You've got to be checking your blood glucose and you've got to be checking blood ketones. This can be very overwhelming for patients at first. Not only do they have the diagnosis of cancer, now I'm asking them to poke their finger, keep track of the charts, do some math. Uh, but this is where the science comes from. The reason I'm giving you such an advanced lesson in metabolism is because it truly can save the lives of patients. They have to get their Dr. Boz number under 80 if they want some autophagy. They have to get it under 40 if you want that immune system to start repairing. Um, but you must get it under 20 if they're really going to be the patients who want to repair and destroy the cancer cells. A Dr. Boz ratio under 20 is no little task. It takes support. It takes somebody walking with them. My mother didn't do great on this because she walked it alone. I did it with her. But we have evidence that say, if you want to fight cancer with a ketogenic diet, there's some higher levels of um, outcomes. This anti-angiogenic is how the blood vessel formation was stopped in these cancer cells. And in part because those electrons that I showed in that metabolism of cancer cells, um, those promote the growth of blood vessels. And when you start to destroy those little micro electrons inside the, the especially the solid tumors, uh, the blood vessel formation stopped. This was destructive to the cancer cells and our chemotherapy, our radiation worked so much better if you could set up the environment that those little electrons weren't present or were very few in number. The other evidence out there is it reduces the inflammation. The inflammation found in a cancer setting or in that cancer cell or in that cancer, the, the ball of a tumor, it's super protective to that cancer. That's how the cancer survives. And again, it's in part because of those free radicals, those little electrons that really create this microenvironment for the cancer to survive. Uh, the other uh, part is uh, apoptosis is programmed cell death. And you might think, well, isn't that like what cancer cells have? No, they stop dying. That's the problem with cancer cells is they no longer get the signal that says, hey, you should die. Your life is over. You're not helping this human. So as you watch what a restricted calories and a ketogenic diet does, these three are very well proven. They get even further into those micro morsels inside cancer cells, but you can, you can take this one with confidence. This is some of the data that Dr. Thomas Seafried uses when he talks about how they use a ketogenic diet to help patients um, survive. So if you, if you look at that, the left side over there is um, that plasma glucose, and then you have the plasma ketones. Uh, the first three days, uh, they actually induce the patients into this process by completely fasting them. That is a rapid step into the ketogenic, uh, ketogenic state. What happens, of course, is that glucose sinks down while those ketones rise. And you might remember from these, uh, these slides before that the glucose is loved by the cancer cell and it cannot use a ketone cell. So to truly help somebody with a cancer improve their outcomes and make the other Western medicine work better, we need to starve those cancer cells. That means that blood glucose can't just drop by a little bit. It really needs to be a lower glucose. And at the same time, your body's flourishing nature to raise ketones, uh, it, needs, it shouldn't be a guess. You should measure those numbers. Of course, when we look at what happens when you calculate that, um, we turn this into a Dr. Boz ratio. Um, Dr. Thomas Seafried uses the glucose ketone index, and for research, that's great. But for my cancer patients, uh, it was just too much math for them to do. So if you look at those are Dr. Boz ratios of 16, 13, 13, and 12, very low numbers under 20 when they're trying to fight cancer. And it's not once a week. This is how they lived for the next six months as they underwent those chemo treatments.
So as we look at that in another way, again, 72 hours of fasting is where those patients started out. And those patients went on what they call a restrictive ketogenic diet. That is 500 calories, uh, kilocalories per day, 500 calories a day. That is really low. You can see in this chart that the red numbers along the side were the glucose ketone index, uh, like Dr. Thomas Seafried and his research team measures when they're treating patients. In my clinic, I use the Dr. Boz ratio. And again, we want that 20 or less, not for a day, not for a week, but especially as they get to that through that first month where they really clean up their metabolism. They limited those calories to less than 500 a day. I would not recommend this in patients who are just doing the ketogenic diet for improvement of their immune system or improvement of their brains. There were sacrifices and very strict things they had to follow to make sure these patients were well-balanced and well-nourished during that very restrictive phase. As they got to about three months, they increased the calories to a full 900 calories per day. Again, very restrictive, but the outcomes can't be argued with. Uh, as they ra raised at nine months their calorie intake to 1,500, again, most of those calories are coming from the bites of fat that they eat throughout the day. A very small portion is coming from protein and carbohydrates. Uh, and finally, they finished out that study at the end um, of 15 months, still on 1,500 calories per day. Now, that very restrictive diet is something that most of my patients can't do without a little help. Uh, when I first start patients on the ketogenic diet and they're doing it for cancer reasons, I uh, push them to use the ketones to help stimulate that, uh, the body to get the ketones inside the blood cells. Uh, the first few times you take a supplement of a ketone, you're going to pee out most of the uh, supplement because your cells don't have the ability to put it inside a cell yet. But as you expose those cells to the ketones, uh, which are called beta-hydroxybutyrate, that exposure increases their skill or reminds those little receptors how to get the ketones from circulation into the cells and then from the cells into these mitochondria. And they spin through with a very efficient, very tightly controlled production of energy. And it's not just a little bit. As we strengthen the cells of their healthy cells, those sugars get less and less and less. It isn't long before patients say, boy doc, I forgot to eat. And as we look at the uh, benefits of a ketogenic diet while having cancer treatment, we know that they lose a fat mass, not muscle mass, as long as we can keep those ketones high enough. We've learned that the beta-hydroxybutyrate is a signaling agent where it helps the DNA wind tighter for the healthy cells and get destroyed for the cancer cells. Uh, it is an improvement in how the immune system talks to one another and how cells replicate. It also prefers to use that uh, energy found in fat as opposed to the cravings found in um, supplying the body with a constant level of glucose. This is a lot to take in for cancer patients. I will tell you that I, um, I find uh, their, their uh, destruction of cancer cells something we imagine together. And as we add ketones and we increase their oxygen level um, by doing a couple other tricks we'll talk about, not only do their cancer cells get destroyed, their healthy cells start to live better. They decrease the amount of fat that they have in their systems. And even though I wish they would have started this long before we started down a chemo treatment plan, I'm delighted that the version coming through the chemotherapy and coming out of the treatment cancer uh, protocols is healthier than it's ever been. For those of you looking to prevent, those, that's what I do. Uh, we look at some of the other reaches of a goal. In my health, I, if you follow me, I usually start on Sundays for a, a weekly fast where I get my Dr. Boz ratio less than 40. I try to reach for a Dr. Boz ratio of 20 at least once a month. And I've learned the cleaner I eat, the easier that is to obtain. Uh, as I look at other areas that um, I could take this uh, science level and show you, uh, the drug metformin or glucophage is something that also dramatically shifts how the, how the metabolism inside those cancer cells and inside those healthy cells 
really does shift. Uh, again, the metformin uh, is a benefit to healthy cells and very destructive to cancer cells. Finally, hyperbaric oxygen is something that I've done for my mom too. Uh, she has continued to do so well on the ketogenic diet. And in part, it's not just because she has fasted for 40 days. She checks her Dr. Boz ratio and reports it to her support group. But we use hyperbaric oxygen to help her body uh, make sure that we can get oxygen into the deepest parts of her bones using a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Now, this is something you got to work with your doctor on, but I hope what you learned in, these, in this slide deck is that if you look at the metabolism deep inside our healthy cells and our cancer cells, and you see why it's so important to have a support group, be measuring your ketone and blood level, and be following with your doctor, I hope what you see is hope for patients who have cancer. Grandma Rose still sees her oncologist and we use chemotherapy when her doctor recommends it. Uh, this is meant to augment the treatment for her cancer and she is better and healthier today at 75 than she's been in 20 years. So thank you for the support of praying for Grandma Rose and for cheering her on. Uh, use her story to help somebody you know. Gift the book any way you can to someone you know that might be struggling with cancer and needs an inspirational story of hope. The sale of the book helps to support this channel and it just might save their life. Signing off as Dr. Boz, improving your health one ketone at a time. Please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to click the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos. Stay tuned.